thing that becomes so important for us in an area that is as charged as sexuality and which really does involve somebody else, where there really is another person or persons who could be uh, put in harm's way, it really becomes incumbent upon us to truly and clearly know ourselves as best we can. I don't think there, I mean, I think that this is true for all practice, but I can think of few other areas where there is as much that is on the line as this whole realm of sexuality and the importance of if we don't know each other, if we don't know ourselves, and we continue to act out our lives karmically, right? We're just being battered around and going hither and yon based upon the causes and conditions of us growing up in whatever family we grew up, the causes and the conditions of growing up gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, however we experience that, the causes and conditions of being in this kind of warped sexual society that we're in. If, if we don't take responsibility at some point, claim full accountability, and really try to know ourselves so that what we bring to the encounters, these encounters, is a, as clear a sense of self as we can possibly muster, then I think that we are bringing less than our full selves. And as practitioners, I think we're probably not going that, making that full effort. Because so much, I mean, it is such a, a tricky, um, slippery area for any of us to, to practice in. I think that that is, is really uh, critical. But I do think that this whole notion of being, um, uh, beings are bound by passion and are released by utilizing passion, I think is true. I would add skillful utilization of that passage. Uh, passion. And then the other uh, one, and this is in line with uh, what I just said about the importance of knowing ourselves, and this is from the Kandamahara Rosana Tantra. One who, possessing desire, represses desire, is living a lie. It's pretty straightforward, I think. One of the people who was uh, responsible for starting this um, uh, uh, school in Zen called Red Th Thread of Passion School was a poet na uh, named Ikkyu, I-K-K-Y-U, Y-U, yeah. And he lived uh, in medieval Japan around, I think he was born in like 1394 or something like that. Um, and um, he actually was a, a, a bit of iconoclastic person, as you can imagine. <laughs> And he wrote very, very um, specifically uh, an explicit uh, uh, haiku that was quite, uh, quite sexual. But he also was quite the artist. And he was um, very influential in a lot of the artistic expression of uh, Soto Zen. Actually, he was Rinzai, but all of Zen in that medieval period. But um, upon his enlightenment, this is what he is purported to have set, uh, written. From the world of passions, Returning to the world of passions, there is a moment's pause. If it rains, let it rain. If the wind blows, let it blow. So I think for me, what I hear in this haiku is this opportunity to, in a certain way, start where I started, go deeply into this ex exploration of my own experience, idea, ideas of, the karma of sexual experience, uh, um, experience come back to a very similar place but with a completely new point of view and perspective in order to uh, have then sexual encounters and sexual relations be just sexual relations, just part of the Dharma, just part of, of as common and as easy as every other aspect of the Dharma that is just here, just now. But I think it is that process of our own turning and inquiry and uh, practice and work that is so important in order to come back to that exact same starting point, but in a different way. And so, so for those of us who are serious practitioners, I think then that this um, Desire in general, sexuality in particular, becomes a Dharma gate through which we can, can pass, through which we can learn, through which we can uh, experience our authentic selves.
We can express our full range of humanness. And it becomes a way in which we, as I was saying earlier, it really embodies the fact that we have made a huge shift and we no longer are living our lives in this way that is just buffeted by the karma of our experience and of our, our lives, but is expressive of the dharma that we um, make a vow to uphold and to embody. And, and what a powerful transition that is in terms of uh, how we hold ourselves in the world and how people experience us in the world. You know, I think that the, the thing about, um, in many ways, the thing about the, uh, the Dharma for me has been that it ultimately has asked me to heal myself. And in that process of healing myself by going, taking a deep dive into the areas where I've been wounded, where I've wounded others, and to look at it with as much clarity as I possibly can, and then to resurface with a fresh perspective, then I have gone through a transformation that is something that, that really matters. And I can then embody a sense of um, minimized suffering, which I think our practice is ultimately all about. <coughs> you know, how do each and every one of us minimize our suffering? That's the, uh, the question of Buddhist practice. I think that's the promise in a certain way of Buddhist practice. How do we heal ourselves? How do we minimize our suffering? How do we model that minimized suffering? And how do somewhere along this, the, the continuum of all of this, how do we touch and, and um, cultivate a type of happiness? And I do think that there is a whole range of happiness and connection and joy that is available to us in this very, very charged and powerful area of sexual uh, connection and, and relationships. So I think that's all I really want to say at this time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening.